1858, he'd been back in the colonies for two years. When the cricket season ended, there was no organised football. And in the middle of 1858, he wrote what I regard as our single most important sporting letter. He wrote that these colonies should form a football club, that they should have a game of our own, not someone else's game, a game of our own. And he sat down in a pub in Melbourne with three other men and they wrote the first rules of what became our national indigenous game, the most watched game in the nation, Australian rules football. They formed the first club, the Melbourne Football Club, and Tom Wills became the first captain of that first club. He shaped the rules and he was the dominant player. He was a remarkable individual. And after creating that team, he moved to Geelong and the second team was created. Tom Wills, as I mentioned, created this unique game in winter and in summer was and remained our dominant cricketer. By the age of 26, the year was 1861, everyone knew the name of Tom Wills. But in that year, something happened to him that changed his life forever and also my life 150 years later. His father had decided to take Tom and the family from Victoria and settle a new property in central Queensland. So at the beginning of 1861, Tom, his dad and 30 other Victorians caught a boat from Melbourne up to Brisbane, Moreton Bay. They disembarked and they collected 10,000 sheep for this new property. Tom, his dad and the 30 Victorians then herded those sheep from Brisbane for eight arduous months into the middle of the Queensland outback. They arrived there at the beginning of October 1861. And then, on the 17th of October, after lunch and in the heat of the day, whilst everyone was sleeping, local Aboriginal people amassed and attacked and slaughtered 19 men, women and children. Amongst the first murdered was Tom's father, Horatio Wills. Tom survived, miraculously, only because several days before the Aboriginals attacked, his father sent him away from the campsite to, get, to collect goods and belongings they'd left en route. When Tom Wills returned one week later, the 19 whites were dead and buried, the blood was dried on the grass, and the 10,000 sheep were dispersed in the Queensland bush. Local white settlers formed posses of revenge and murdered, it is reckoned, somewhere between 60 to 300 Aboriginal people in response. And this is important. Though Tom Wills was angry and vengeful, there is no evidence that he took part in any reprisal raids at all. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have just described to you the single biggest massacre in the settling of my nation, your nation, Australia. I wonder how many people in this audience actually have heard of that or even know the name of that massacre. Because let me tell you, when I came across this, that's what got under my skin and needled me so often in New York. The reason my parents came to this wonderful country, Australia, was for one reason, from Sri Lanka, to give me a first-rate education, and I've had that. Yet nowhere in my reading had I come across this single biggest massacre, the Cullen Laringo Massacre. And I asked myself back then, what sort of nation was it that so neglected the telling of its own stories to its own people neglected its history and didn't tell these stories to its own children. So I was determined to go up and find the massacre site in Queensland and I wanted to know how it affected Tom Wills back in 1861. So I found one of Tom's relatives in Geelong 
And they said, Greg, our family, the Wills family, still live right next to the massacre site in central Queensland. And I thought, fantastic, beauty. I'll go up there and have a chat. They then warned me and said, Greg, I've got to tell you that our family up there don't like people from the city much, and you live in Sydney. And I've also got to tell you, they completely hate psychiatrists and shrinks. <laughs> but I was tenacious, and I found out that the Mr. Wills who lived on the massacre site was a multi-millionaire, a cattle grazier. So I took my chance and I flew up from Sydney to Rockhampton, had one sleepless night in a cheap motel, got up early and drove six or seven hours into the interior of Queensland. And there, rising from the horizon like gone with the wind, was this magnificent 19th century homestead, the Wills homestead. And out the front was this Mr. Wills waiting for me, dressed in a terry toweling hat, a blue work singlet, stubby shorts and thongs. And as I catapulted out of my hire vehicle, I thought he might warmly welcome me. Instead, he scrutinised me from head to toe. And I could see immediately, because I'm a psychiatrist, <laughs> that he didn't like what he saw. <laughs> and I thought he was going to kick me all the way back to Balmain. He came towards me and scowled and said, you're up here now. What do you want to do? And I said, Mr. Wills, I've come a long way from Sydney. I'm hot and tired. It's almost noon. I'd love a drink. And with that, his whole demeanor changed. He flung his arms out wide, came towards me and said, ah, oh, mate, you're my kind of bloody shrink and gripped me incredibly tightly, like I was a long lost brother. And we started walking away from the homestead. And he explained that he lived in the homestead with his elderly mother, just the two of them. He whispered to me that she was starting to lose her memory and was a bit paranoid, and it kicked him out of the house. He now lived in a shack at the back. We walked another 10 meters, and he whispered conspiratorially into my ear, Doc, I think you could do a consult on her tomorrow for me. <laughs> so we walk into the shack where one of the richest men in rural Queensland's living, and I'm completely covered by tobacco smoke because he's smoking roll your owns the whole time. On the floor, there's a greasy mattress where he sleeps every night. Next to it's an ashtray that looks like Mount Vesuvius. There's a little fridge in the corner. He goes to it, flicks open the door, and I peer over his shoulder. And all I can see is a blur of gold and maroon. He has line after line of cans of 4X beer there. And I'll never forget, he turned over and said, Doc, would you like to start with five cans of beer or four? And I said, I'm a conservative man, four will be fine. <laughs> By six o'clock that evening, we were the best of mates. There was a crazy emu at the front door trying to pick its way in, and then, he said something that really floored me. He said, Greg, the family have kept two handwritten letters from the 1861 massacre. We've never allowed anyone to read them. Would you like to read them? We got up, walked to another bungalow, and he sat me down, and from beneath the table, he pulled out a trunk, not of two letters, but over 200 handwritten letters written between 1861 and 1920, and poured them in front of me like a waterfall. The letters told me about the Aboriginal massacre, how the whites responded, about Queensland frontier life, and told me all about the beginnings of cricket and Australian rules football in this nation. They were torn, and they were affected by water. They were damaged. They were convoluted, and I moved them around like tectonic plates, trying to make sense of them. He came over to me, Mr. Wills, and said, Greg, you can stay up as long as you like. And he left me six cans of 4X beer. <laughs> the next time I looked at my watch, it was 4 a.m. I'd been doing it the entire night. I went to my own bungalow, 
I slept two troubled hours. At 6 a.m., there was a knock. And it was Mr. Wills at the front door, and he shouted out, Doc, I know it's early, but do you think you could do that consult on me mum now? <laughs> I'll never forget pulling on my T-shirt, my jeans, and my thongs, and walking out in this bright Queensland sun. And in my mind's eye, I was this gargantuan can of 4X beer. My legs were like prongs poking out of the base. We walked to the front door of this Will's mansion. He excused himself and to look after the cattle. Within several minutes, it was clear to me that his mother was in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. She drifted away, she left the front door open, and I gently pushed my way in. On the far side of a darkened room, all the windows were covered with blankets. The place hadn't been cleaned in a generation. But on the far side of that darkened room was a line of very old books. I went to them, pulled back on the spine of one of the books, and the dust of a generation went into my eyes. But on the inside flap was written Tom Wills, Rugby School, Warwickshire, 1854. I found all the textbooks Tom had used back at rugby school 150 years ago not in England, but in the Australian outback. He had left them there after the massacre of 1861. The letters told me what happened to Tom's mind after the 19 whites were murdered and the up to 300 blacks were murdered. His mind unraveled. He had flashbacks and nightmares each evening about Aboriginals attacking. He had what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. And he treated it as men and women have treated it over the years. He hit the bottle hard. He used alcohol to get to sleep every evening. Alcohol became a balm for his troubled spirit. Tom Wills remained in central Queensland for two further years, but he was never a farmer. He was a libertine sportsman. He returned to Melbourne and continued developing the game of Australian rules football with Melbourne and then Geelong. And he continued captaining the Victorian cricket team, still the finest cricketer of the age. Five, we, five years after that massacre, Tom's living in Melbourne. And then he undertakes what I regard as the single most important act any sportsman or sportswoman has ever undertaken in Australia. An act that required courage, moral courage, not physical courage. At the end of 1866, five years after his dad's massacre, Tom Wills leaves Melbourne, travels back through Western Victoria, through the Grampians, where he grew up as a boy, to far Western Victoria, to Harrow and Edenhope. And what does this white man do, whose father was butchered in the biggest massacre? He does the unexpected. He finds 10 Aboriginal farm labourers, and he teaches them the game of cricket. He helps create an Aboriginal cricket team, and he becomes their captain, and he becomes their coach. And he brings that Aboriginal cricket team back to Melbourne. And they walk onto the MCG, Boxing Day 1866, a white man followed by 10 black cricketers. The colony is agog and can't believe it. To most of the people in the colony, Tom Wills is shaming his father's memory by playing cricket with Aboriginal people. But to a smaller group of colonists, Tom Wills is a hero for building a bridge between Aboriginal Australia and white Australia. I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, there's only one thing shameful in Tom's act in creating that Aboriginal team in the shadow of that biggest massacre, and it's this. I bet there's barely a man or a woman sitting in front of me that has a son or a daughter, or more importantly, a grandson or a granddaughter that could tell you that story. Because this story 
one of the first great acts of healing in our nation should be known by every child in the nation, and it's not. Tom Wills took that team all around Victoria. It wasn't about climate change or financial crisis. The headlines were Tom Wills, white man, and his black team. He was the name on everyone's lips. And he brought the team to Sydney. They lived at Manly Beach. They played at Wollongong, Parramatta, Newcastle. They were due to go to England. But at the last moment, the tour fell apart because of financial problems. And one year later, that Aboriginal team was resurrected and they did go to England. But it was an Englishman that took that Aboriginal team to England, not Tom Wills. After the tour folded, Tom returned to playing football and cricket. We heard about Jack Marsh and the controversy about throwing. Well, I'll tell you this. In 1872, Tom Wills became the first first-class cricketer to be called for throwing in cricket. It was a conspiracy to rid him from the game. As he grew older and his fearsome, fearsome bowling was less fearsome and he bowled less fast, he resorted to the odd chuck. Accused of corrupting young bowlers, he was called for throwing. Tom Will's last few years were crumbling years. He still won occasional cricket matches and still left the field chaired on the shoulders of his playmates, that sweetest of all altitudes for a sportsman. But in the last year of his life, now drinking very heavily, he lived on the outskirts of Melbourne with his de facto, Tom never married, he never had any children, but he'd lived with the same woman for 15 years. In April 1880, drinking very heavily, he stopped and developed that condition we call DTs, delirium tremens. His de facto fearing for her life and his whisked him to the Royal Melbourne Hospital where they promised to look after him. He stayed there two hours, absconded. He returned back to their house in Heidelberg on the edge of Melbourne and the following day in full view of his de facto, Tom Wills took his own life. To take your own life in 1880, was as every bit as tragic as it, is, as it is in the 21st century. But back then, a coroner could force the person to be buried at night time, and a minister of religion could refuse to read a service over the gravesite to inflict an indignity on that person's family. When Tom Wills died, a reporter from the age went to his mother and asked, can you tell us about your son, Thomas? She was so mortified by his suicide that she said to the reporter, I have no son called Thomas. She disowned him, and in none of her letters after his death is his name ever mentioned. Tom Wills was, borrowed, uh, was buried privately, shamefully, in Heidelberg, in an earthen grave, a pauper's grave. There was no headstone. And it remained like that for 100 years until the oldest cricket club in Australia, the Melbourne Cricket Club, returned to that cemetery, rummaged through the weeds, found his gravesite, and righted the neglect of a century by erecting a headstone. When I go to schools and I tell boys and girls this story, I tell them this, and this is the message I want them to remember, that they have heard one fantastic story today, one fantastic Australian story. You know what, I tell them? There are dozens of great Australian stories out there. Go out, find one for yourself. If it's buried, dig it up, breathe life into it, and articulate it to our nation. The Tom Will story is a remarkable one. It truly is. It tells us a great deal about who and what we are as a nation and as a people. And for me, that's its lasting legacy, for it takes us to the heart of this great country.
and it offers us a vision and an understanding of the meaning about being an Australian. Thank you very much.